Hi, my name is Jarek and I'm a postgrad research student at GMIT Campus Mayo. Today I want to talk to you about the SwiftPod projects that we have on our campus, the history of it, how it started and the research that I'm conducting as well based on the data uh, that we have available from that project. So, I just want to introduce myself first. So, my name is Jarek, I'm Polish and I live in Ireland since uh, 2005. In 2018, I graduated from Outdoor Education uh, Program here in GMIT in Castlebar. Uh, before that, I worked as an outdoor instructor um, in many places around the country and many uh, adventure centers such as uh, Delphi, Kinsale, OVC. And I'm an adventurer, I've been to over 30 countries in my life. Uh, one of those things, uh, I've done some cool, cool things in my life, one of those things, probably a highlight was uh, go to the Everest uh, base camp in the Himalayas. Before I get into the details of the project, I want to introduce you to the subject of my research, the common swift. Highly migratory species, they spend most of the year in their wintering grounds in Africa. However, the breeding grounds are in the northern hemisphere, including Ireland. The breeding season begins in May with their arrival in their nests and ends in September when they depart. Each season the pair of the swifts will come back to the same nest. They lay one clutch per year and if the breeding season is successful, one to three chicks will fledge from one nest. In Ireland the common swift nests exclusively in the urban areas. They find the nest locations in man-made structures such as churches, old buildings, castles, wherever they can find and exploit the crevice between the brick or the eave of the roof. They are highly specialized to live in the air. They eat, drink, mate in the air. They, when they are immature or migrating, they can even sleep during the flight. Unfortunately, their numbers in Ireland and in the UK are in decline and they are currently on the amber list of endangered species. The reason for this decline is still a source of speculations. With the decline of food sources such as the insect or loss of nest locations due to, due to building renovations and knockdowns as a main listed reasons. The common swift is a very unique bird species. It spends most of the year flying away from the breeding grounds and builds nests in places that are hard to access. This makes the study of the species biology very challenging. The research title of my project is The Breeding Biology of the Common Swift in County Mayo Factors Affecting Breeding Success. What's important here is the source of data, which is 18 boxes with cameras at GMIT Mayo campus, streaming and recording 24 7 during the breeding season. So, every good research needs a good hypothesis. And our is the research project is designed to test the hypothesis that the climate and weather conditions in the west of Ireland do not limit breeding success of the common swift. So here's uh, the main focus of the of our research. So what we're looking at in the summary is the ability of the adult swift to rear the chick successfully in our area. Um, so what we're looking at is when we are watching the videos that we recorded from the nest boxes is how many times per day the adult swifts feed their chicks and we also record the weather and then we will compare the number of feeding events per chick with the weather factors to see if the weather is influencing or perhaps not the feeding frequency of the of, of the of the chicks so that will be the main focus. Now there are some other opportunities as well that may come from the project. We will be very happy if we get some valuable da data for those. And these are on the, on the right side of the slide. So we will try to assess the nest boxes um, as, the, as the viable option for the, for the swift nest uh, uh, building. Uh, we will look at the ectosing behavior, I'm gonna mention that later. We're gonna, we're gonna look at the collection of uh, nest material yearly colony growth, confrontations with the intruding swifts and we will also, um, we also collect the unhatched eggs at the end of each season for the analysis of the, for the chemical analysis um, and we are looking at the, um, at the pesticides, if there is in fact uh, pesticides uh, 
visible um, in the X. So what we, what our main goal is during the summers is collection of the recordings from the nests. So we record nest box activity during the breeding season, that is from May to September, and we record them 24-7. The footage from 2018 and 19 is already saved and analyzed. 2020 footage will be analyzed this year. Uh, the Swifts have come back already, so we will begin recording very, very soon. And we basically record the whole season and we will analyze it. So we will have three, three full seasons of, of the data. So the estimated total time of, uh, of all those recordings is 28,000 hours. Now this is a huge number and it's quite daunting, but it, unfortunately for me, doesn't take 28,000 hours to, to view those videos. I have uh, a technique that allows me to view those videos uh, very fast, which I'm going to demonstrate to you in a second. And so up here I'm going to show you um, an example of, of the video that we uh, record um, from just one of the nest box, box number 11. And um, so when the recording is finished, I then download it and then my task is to basically watch it all um, and record all the important events that are happening. Doesn't, this video is 22 hours long, however, it doesn't take me 22 hours to, to view the video. I use the software called VLC that allows me to skip the video by 3, 10, seconds, by 3 seconds, 10 seconds or 1 minute. So I use hotkeys to do so. So for example in this case I will try to skip the video by 10 seconds so you can see and basically that way I can monitor the changes in the, in the nest. So at the moment two chicks are by themselves so what I'm waiting now is for the adults to come back. So hopefully that will happen soon. Not much is happening, so I perhaps I can skip by the minute to speed up the process. Okay, I think I saw a change. happening unfortunately. There we go. Something happened so I can go back three seconds. So okay so now I know that the adult swift comes back to feed the chick. Now what I do is I take the sheet just as this one okay and I take this time and I mark it exact time and what type of event happened. So if you want to play the video again, I'm going to play the video. So you can see the adult comes back with a meal for the chick. There we go, we can clearly see that one of the chicks was basically fed. So I just make a note of that, of all of those events, I put them on a sheet and then I transfer them to the Excel file. Okay, so and I do that for the, for the, whole, for the whole video. I just want to mention about the equipment that we use. So what you see on the left side of the slide is the cameras that are inside of the box uh, and they are called, they're called green feathers and they record in an analog format which we then uh, digitize. And what you see on the right side is the, is the boxes, uh, so the triplets entrance Schwegler uh, boxes. This is one of the cameras that we used in the boxes. Um, it's, exac it's exactly the same one. Um, this one was removed from one of the boxes because it malfunctioned. Uh, but it gives me an opportunity to show you uh, what equipment uh, we use. So it's not very big, but it's very basic. Um, it, it's, um, it records in analog format. So um, we have to then digitize it, as I mentioned already. And um, you can... Um, adjust the zoom this way okay and those cameras actually allow you to record in the dark and um, also 
Uh, they're very basic, uh, they cost about uh, 40 euro and the company that produced them, produce them called, it's called Green Feathers. So we also have a recording station. Um, so all those cameras are, are connected to uh, four PCs. We use two DVRs and we have to use four analog, uh, analog digital converters. We also have a couple of TV screens that allow us to view those videos as well. And we also use a software that allows us to record and stream at the same time. It's called, it's called Flash Media Encoder. And now I'll show you the, also the video that I made in the, um, at the station as well. This is our uh, recording station, uh, where as you can see there is uh, plenty of equipment. We have four PCs all together. Um, and um, we need them to record the footage from the nest themselves. Okay, so uh, this on this desk is, as you can see, is all the equipment. Um, and then, if you see all those cables, those cables are connected to the cameras in the nest, which are actually just above there. We can't see them uh, just now. Uh, but let's have, but let's have a look at the computer anyway. So, as you can see on this screen. Uh, we see the feed from uh, one of the nests, which is uh, which is right over there, um, up the top somewhere. So uh, we have the camera connected, um, and we use this uh, software that allows us to uh, basically record and also stream the videos online. Okay, this is uh, another computer with uh, with a feed from a different box, and. Uh, you can see this is a um, on this large screen we have a feed from eight boxes as you can see one of the swifts just came back so um, just to manage uh, that data space uh, really um, and the ease of the streaming for the setup we have eight cameras on um, basically one feed as well um, we can have a little close-up for the swifts what are they doing here so they just came back into the nest. There's another one right here. It's the middle of the day, so there is not a huge amount of activity. I'm just gonna wake this computer up. Just see. Maybe there, there we go. Okay, I'm just gonna go back to this box over here. It's still really early in the season, but as you can see, there's uh, already one egg in the nest. It's, uh, today is the 11th, which is actually really early. Uh, last year we had the first egg on, the, I believe it was the 20th. So this year the Swifts are, um, uh, they came back really early and they, being, they, begin the, they began the breeding season uh, really early as well. So we would expect uh, within a week or two of time, most of those, um, most of those uh, boxes would have eggs uh, in them. So now we are in the courtyard of GMIT Mayo campus. So just a second ago, you guys were in the Swift lab. Okay. Now we're on the outside. If you have a look up there, these are the Swift boxes. So we also should be able to see the, the, the cables. So those cables actually go into the Swift lab that you guys uh, saw just, uh, just a couple of seconds ago. So these four boxes, they were the first, um, they were the first ones to put in. Um, and then the two that are over there, they were installed uh, last year. The weather information that's important for our, um, for our uh, analysis later is uh, actually comes from the college itself. We have our own weather station um, which we installed and that weather station uh, allows us to monitor um, things like uh, daily rain, uh, wind, temperature. So this is the location where we have the weather station. As you can see, this is the unit, the Davis Weather Pro uh, station unit that, uh, that you see. This, uh, this is a wireless, wireless unit. It sends a signal to my desk, which is just behind a couple of walls there, and that's uh, connected to my computer. And then, um, and then it's my, my computer basically stores that stores that data uh, for uh, later use. So if you have a look at the station again as well, again, uh, you see that we are measuring the, the wind. We also there's like a 
there's like a copter at the top uh, that collects the water and basically um, we are able to um, to record how much rain is, 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 is falling down. But this station is actually maybe 100 meters uh, from the from the nest box project that gives us like really accurate um, weather for where our sluits uh, live basically. So now that uh, we talked about uh, the equipment, you guys saw the inside of the of the Swift Lab, the recording station. Now you saw the boxes um, just up here as well. So you can probably imagine that uh, the project is quite complex. So um, it was probably not uh, an, easy com an easy project to start as well. And I could talk about the beginning of the project. However, I wasn't involved in it, but I know someone that was. Uh, and it's actually a person who uh, started this project. Her name is uh, Linda Hoxley, and she's been very active um, in the local community here and in the local sort of environmental um, environmental protection movement. So we're just going to do a quick little interview uh, with Linda. Uh, we're going to talk about the beginning of the project and uh, basically her involvement and what that project basically led to. So, uh, Linda, you were an initiator of the Swiftbox project at uh, GMIT. Uh, Mayor Campos, and now you are, uh, and you, and you are among many other things. You are a founder of the environmental NGO Swift Conservation uh, Mayo. So, where did your interest um, into the Swifts come from, and why did you start the Swift project in GMIT? Okay, um, well, it's probably quite a long story, but I'll do my best to keep it brief. No, um, I am. Um, <laughs> I'm um, married to a conservationist, so my interest in the environment started um, about 35 years ago um, when I met him and we lived in Africa for a short while. So I was very aware of the swifts because swifts migrate to southern Africa um, when they're outside their breeding season in Europe. So we were living in Malawi, which is one of the countries where um, the Swifts go to. So to cut a very long story short, we moved to the west of Ireland in, um, well, 20 years ago. So that would be the year 2000. And I very quickly got a job at GMIT working in the administration. And um, those were very early days in environmental thoughts in Ireland and after a few years um, I found that there were a few people on campus that were interested in the environment and so we decided amongst a group of us to explore um, having a green campus, doing things on campus that would be as simple as recycling and so on. So uh, there was nothing really to work towards, um, but we did know that the green schools movement existed in the schools in our island, in the uh, national schools and, and primary schools. So we contacted Antashka, who run the green schools program, the Antashka being the equivalent of like the National Trust for, for Ireland. And it coincided with them wanting to explore establishing green campus at third level so uh, they um, so we set up a trial to become one of the green campuses as an IT and Cork were um, setting up as a green campus at the university level um, so anyway we worked very hard and we worked on the ver the projects that you'd imagine we would which is waste and litter and saving energy and, and those things but one of the those are the principal themes of green campus but once you've achieved those um, flags you have to keep progressing every year and one of the additional themes is um, biodiversity so this will be really the theme that was very close to my heart and I decided to become the leader of that theme um, so being an admin worker, admin workers work all year round in the colleges, it, you know it's not like academics that aren't there in the summer and the students aren't there. So I was in a position to notice every summer there were swifts coming to the GMIT building and you'd hear them screaming in the courtyard. But I noticed 
over the years, every year the numbers were declining. Uh, so I just by chance learned that you could erect nest boxes and try and do something for SWIFTS. And so voila, that was really the start of that initiative. We could do something for SWIFTS and I really wanted to, to give that a go. Okay, excellent. And uh, what year was it, um, if you can remember, if you can recall, uh, when did you learn about the SWIFT boxes and when did you decide to put them in college? It was actually um, 2011. 2011. Uh, when, yeah, 2011 when we when I read an article that there were there was a group in Northern Ireland, the um, yeah the Northern Ireland Swift group, um, and uh, so I contacted one of the the main people there, Brian Cahalan, and invited him down to the campus to give us a talk on Swifts and to look at the campus and this and and advise us where we could put the Swift boxes. Um, at that time, I had no idea where the Swifts were, had their natural nests in the building. But because the campus is an old psychiatric hospital dating from the 1800s, it's the typical sort of building that Swifts choose to, to have their natural nests um, in, in Irish towns. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So, so this was um, one of the first boxes, Swift boxes in Ireland uh, at the time, I can probably uh, imagine. So, um, long story short, the consequence of that is pretty much starting your own NGO uh, within a couple of years, uh, which mm. is the Swift Conservation, Ar Swift Conservation Mayo. And then I believe it evolved to Swift Conservation Ireland, a more national uh, project. Mm. Tell, tell us something about that. Um, mm. Okay, so starting up the Nestbox project at GMIT, that's all I thought I was doing. I thought we'd just put a project, a Nestbox project there and um, and that would be it. But news spread about this project, especially because we put a couple of nest box cameras in the in the boxes, and we got Swifts in 2014, which was two years after we installed the boxes. We installed the boxes in 2012. So we then started to live stream, and word spread that GMIT, you know, was live streaming. But then people started to contact me from around the county saying, well, we know there are Swifts in this building and it's going to be renovated and the Swifts will be lost and so on. But then I discovered there was no, um, there was no survey identifying which buildings in towns were being used by Swifts. So therefore, um, the nest sites could be um, destroyed and nobody would be any the wiser because people didn't know that there were Swifts in, in buildings. So therefore, that led to a, me and a group of volunteers surveying every town in Mayo to establish where all the natural nest sites were. So that was kind of the, the, the start of it, really. Okay, excellent. Uh, I want to come back to the SWIFT project that's, uh, that we have in GMIT. Um, what uh, our listeners would probably be very interested in, how, how do you start projects such as this one? I know that the um, GMIT is a public institution uh, as well. What was it like getting approval from them? Um, what was it like getting funding um, and basically just support from the staff? And what were the difficulties? Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Yeah. So the Nestbox project is this. Yes. That, um, yeah. Offer the yeah. Um, so. Initially, the Green Campus was really a Mayo thing. Right. Um, the, the Galway Campus and, and the Letterac Campus, they weren't really engaging in it. Uh, so we were doing this as, um, you know, as a Mayo Campus thing. Um, but the wa there wasn't really any uh, funding available for that sort of thing. So we applied for something that was called a Local Agenda 21 grant from Mayo County Council. And that provided us with the money to buy the initial four triple boxes, which gave us 12 swiftness boxes. Um, and then the cameras were actually sponsored by staff. So initially we had two cameras, but once they got swifts in, the rest of the staff wanted to be part of it and they sponsored the rest of the cameras. Um, but then, of course, the project um, evolved and the live streaming, so the technicians got involved, they gave their time freely, and we managed to, um, to get a link with the Higher Education Network so that we could put the, the live stream over the GMIT 
website. So it evolved really, um, you know, just naturally and ergonomically. There was no plan really, but it just captured people's imagination. Yeah, perfect. What were the difficulties, if you can recall any major difficulties with starting projects such as this one? Um, well, we had to get um, permission. Well, getting the money was the first challenge, right. you know, and of course then we had to get buildings and estates permission to install the boxes because uh, you, you know, this is a listed building and also we were working at over five meters high so we had to get, um, you know, the, the contractors that work on the college, they had to install the boxes. There was quite a lot of red tape to go through um, but we just uh, managed to do it with goodwill and, uh, and that's really how the project has progressed is with the goodwill of people and people being very, very interested in, in, in it being, um, as you mentioned earlier, it's the first real um, swift nest box project in the Republic of Ireland that's on a public building. When we set up that project, there was one other nest box project in the Republic and that was in Tubbercurry Town. Uh, so we became really a very, very important project and we still are internationally because we now have, as you know, we now have a live stream with uh, and we have cameras in 12 well it's now 18 nest boxes isn't it so we've cameras in 18 nest boxes and and that's quite significant okay excellent thank you for that um, next question i just want to you to recall like the first success of the project of those swift boxes that the first thing that when it happened you went this was all worth it I love what I've done, I'm very proud of it. Just that one moment, if you can recall it. Mm, I can recall it very easily. It was the first year we put the nest boxes up, 2012. Mm. And um, when the Swifts arrived back, we had Swifts looking at the nest boxes mm. because we were playing the attraction calls, which you have to do to help them find the boxes. But then the next big, big moment came in 2013 um, we had connect connected our two cameras to an old um, television in in the the lab near the near the boxes, and we saw a swift in the nest boxes, and I was jumping up and down for joy because that to me was like that was it was all worth it. It was going to work. Yeah. Excellent, and it's amazing to think that going back from that moment that um, that this year um, we will expect. 12 boxes of occupancy perhaps and maybe even 8 breeding pairs uh, so it's amazing how how quickly uh, the project grew um, mm. and last question I want to ask you um, when did the idea to start to research um, sort of sort of uh, started to evolve um, uh, I understand that the recording uh, of the Swifts um, started in 2015 but when did you realize that there is a real possibility to um, to contribute to sort of uh, science and the uh, knowledge of biology of the Swift? Mm. Um, it really, the, the, the kernel of thought came to me in 2014 because um, there were, every two years there's an international Swift conference and that the, the conference in 2014 was in Cambridge in England and, um, and Brian Carlan in Northern Ireland said you should go along to that conference and tell people about your project. So I didn't really realise that it would be of any importance but then when I got to Cambridge and I heard all the other talks I realised how little opportunity there is to study Swifts and that we really had quite a special thing going there that there were quite a lot of questions that people were asking themselves about SWIFTS and we had the opportunity maybe to start putting something in place to to answer those questions okay amazing thank you very much so that's basically all the questions I have for you for now Linda um, just before we uh, finish um, maybe just advise people how can they find you if they're interested in your project um, and the stuff that you're doing and with the Swifts, uh, where, can they where can they find you? Online, perhaps? Uh, yeah, online, yeah. There's, um, there's a Swift um, Conservation Island uh, Facebook page and then there's a website, swiftconservation.ie. 
and so uh, my contact details are on the on the website and they can actually there is a link to the the gmit um, webcams on that website and there's examples of all sorts of projects and advice as well excellent thank you very much linda for your time thank you thanks Jerry. thank you linda for this uh, for this interview uh, now, however, I want to move on to another subject. Um, so, as I already explained uh, how I collect the data and all the equipment, now I want to talk to you about some of the struggles that are, that are ahead of me. With all the data, with all the recordings from the Swift videos, I also have the video, the, sorry, I also have the weather data as well. So. Now, at the end of the research, well, I will have all of, the, uh, all of the numbers together. I will have to compare them with the weather, da with the weather data to basically come out to, to, to the conclusion of the, of the whole research. And it's not as easy um, as, it, as, it, as it sounds. So with the next couple of slides, uh, I'm just going to try to explain to you um, just the challenge that um, that I'm facing. Um, now there is a um, couple of limited, couple of technological limitations uh, with the way we're gonna do this uh, recording. So apologies if there is a kind of a loss of quality um, with the voice and perhaps the recording. Uh, but bear with me. We'll try to get through it. Uh, first of all, I would like to apologize for perhaps the low quality of audio in this part. Of the presentation, but the important data that I'm able to see from uh, or collect apologies uh, from those videos is the arrival date, clutch size, incubation duration, uh, feeding frequency, and fledging date. So that information from those sheets, when I when I um, watch the videos, uh, all the information I record on the on the sheets, then I have to transfer them to the Excel file. This is what the Excel file looks like when it's finished. So each day uh, I mark with the yellow panel, uh, which is up here. So each uh, each video is dated, and each video starts with uh, with zero, and then I record the timestamp for each event that's taking place on a particular day. So we have uh, functions that let us calculate the, the time of the event when it happened during the day. So for example, this event, which is the when the second adult came back into the nest, uh, came back in for the night, happened eight hours forty two minutes into into the video, and that there's a function that let us calculate that this event happened at uh, two minutes past uh, ten. We also have a function that let us calculate how long that event took place. So once the last adult uh, so came back into the nest, um, he spent nine hours in the nest before left in the morning for its morning feeding. Here we record the feeding uh, events uh, as well, a couple of other things as well that, that, that might uh, prove important later on in the research. Well, those are the main things. Now I'm going to move on to the second slide. On this slide, I just want to give you an example of uh, what's going to happen at the very end. Once I collect all the information, or once I we let all those functions calculate the number of feeding events per day, and we add on the weather recordings as well, weather data. So this is just an example of the table um, from 2015. I picked this week because it's actually uh, pretty interesting to find out and this is will illustrate some of the challenges that are ahead of me. So um, this is a collection for the week. So let's have a look at this part. So this in this part we basically uh, calculated how many times the feeding events happen on that on that particular day. It goes from 17, drops to 14, then goes down to 9, then climbs back up again to 15, 14, 22, and 13. So as you can see, the numbers here are uh, are quite varied. Now my task is to figure out why, have an answer to uh, to why. So that variety of numbers is probably caused by the weather factors, but let's look closer at them. For this exercise, we're only going to look at the rain. Now in this part, we have uh, rain data for that day. 
and if you can see up here 19.2 on the second day it's a quite a substantial number this is basically a storm weather so that's the that's the day when it could be localized flooding so quite a lot of rain and the uh, difficult uh, difficult weather conditions so you might think that the weather conditions like this will severely affect the ability of swifts to collect food for the chicks however they collected the food 14 times that day now the number dropped to nine the next day but if you can see the rain kind of settled it was still had probably having enough but it was definitely less than the day before now the rain is heavier again on the day before but the feeding frequency is rising Interestingly, it climbs back up all the way to 22, but the rain is quite moderate. On the last day, the rain is heavy again, and the feeding frequency drops. So at the moment, is there a pattern? It's very hard to say. So, I saw this all of this that data from last week and I thought there must be some more information here that I can dig out I can't really tell anything from here from this part now this is just uh, another graph that helps me to uh, illustrate the data so the red is basically the amount of rain that happened that day blue excuse me blue is the event the feeding events so as you can see it is quite varied and it's very hard to see the pattern here so I decided to dig deep and I'm gonna concentrate on the second day when then the rain was quite substantial so while this is a daily data I've decided to look at the hourly weather data so in this part I have the weather data for that day for the same day by the hour interestingly most of that rain, that heavy rain, happened in the middle of the night, between 2 o'clock up until 8 a.m. Now during that time, uh, adult swifts very rarely collect food, they, um, and they would stay in the nest. So just from that, I can see that while it appears that there was quite a substantial amount of rain on that day, it didn't affect the swift feeding ability at all that day the rain then kind of settled and there was still plenty of time for the adult swift to collect to collect enough meals for the chicks if we go back to that sheet from that day we can tell that the last time when the activity was recorded in the nest was at 10:31 the previous day on the 25th and then then the adult swift left the nest at half 10 in the morning next day which is 12 hours of no active well 12 hours of the adult swift uh, staying in the nest which is a very long long interval because usually swifts um, adult swifts will leave the nest at around five o'clock in the morning with the for their, for their morning feed. So this is just one of the examples, just an illustration uh, for you guys with, uh, with the amount of data that I have and all those little examples. Um, so that's just basically the task that I do. We're almost at the end of the presentation. However, uh, I, just before we finish, I want to talk to you about another aspect of the research that is actually really, really interesting. The known behavior of egg tossing by the Swifts. So far, there was, there's no research into the subject, no meaningful research into the subject, and there is a, uh, there's a lot of speculation about the subject um, among the ornithologists. It is known that the Swifts lose the eggs during the breeding season. However, uh, so far no one gave an answer of why does it that happen. Now, with this research, with the amount of recording that we do, we see all of those events. So we are able to come out, we probably will be able to come out with the, uh, 
with the answer to this, to this question of why do swifts lose so many eggs during the breeding season. We are at the end of the uh, presentation, so I want to uh, I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank uh, Pierce McDonald for giving me uh, uh, this opportunity. I want to thank Linda for the interview. Uh, I want to take uh, I want to take a moment to thank Marina uh, for a for editing of this video. And at the very end, we want to include uh, a video of uh, us releasing a Swift uh, last year. This Swift was uh, brought to Linda and she took care of it for about two weeks, I believe, and then we released it, re -re -released it close to our colony at the grounds of GMIT. So, uh, thank you very much and please enjoy!